from MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. Good Monday morning. It's 530. Welcome to Montana This Morning. I'm Victoria Hill. Thank you so much for starting your day with us. And good morning, morning. to Miller here with a completely different week than what we saw last week. Absolutely. Those frigid temperatures, uh, a far cry from what we're having this week. Above average for most of us over the course of the next several days. Unfortunately, it's going to be very dry out there. We could use some much needed moisture, just not a lot of that in the cards. Our big story really is going to be the next couple of days. Not only are we going to be above average, but we're looking at those winds and we'll tell you about those winds uh, and some timelines and peak wind gusts. We're thinking here with the main forecast coming up 34 right now at the airport feels like 23 winds out of the southwest at about 20 miles an hour. Look at this over on our eastern side northeast. We're still below zero in Glendive. Don't worry, guys, you're going to be warming up too. We got 13 currently in Miles City, brought us at 18, 24 in Forsyth. We're at the freezing mark in Roundup, 21 in White Sulphur Springs, down in Cody, we're 21, 17 in Sheridan. See those highs today, mainly in the 30s and 40s today. Could some of us possibly flirt with some 50s over the course of the next few weeks or a few days this week? There's a possibility, and of course, we're going to be dealing with some winds. More on that in just a bit. Miller's random number of the day, it's 41. Has something to do with public toilets. A lot of answers coming in. Get yours in now. That answer comes before six. Victoria. The pandemic kicks off our news this week. COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations continue to impact hospitals across Montana and the nation. But some big changes this week are expected when it comes to testing, specifically at home tests. Reporter Joe St. George breaks down what you'll soon have to do if you want to check if your family is infected or not. This week, more changes are expected in an effort to fight the pandemic. The biggest change, one involving those at-home tests, which depending on where you live can be difficult to find right now. Americans will start to get reimbursed. According to the White House COVID response team, this week is when insurance companies will be required to begin reimbursing you for buying those at-home tests in stores. The price of those have varied greatly recently, although usually they're between 14 to 25 bucks. The price has gone up nationwide over the last few days after various agreements with the federal government expired. So how will getting reimbursed work? Well, if a pharmacy or store doesn't work with your insurance company to make it free up front, it will likely mean you will still have to pay for it first on your own. To get reimbursed, you will likely have to go online and submit a claim. That process for some insurance companies takes 10 minutes to complete with the money coming back to you in 10 to 15 days, although that may vary and take longer. As far as getting that separate government website up and running so that you can request free at-home tests, major news is expected this week as well with the federal government finalizing agreements with the Postal Service to make sure they have enough staff to get those tests delivered. The public contracting period closed last week regarding this issue and some tests will start arriving at government facilities this week, which means deliveries will start soon. If you are wondering if the United States can keep up with this demand, according to health officials, production has been ramping up nationwide. In September, the United States was producing around 50 million tests per month. This month, 200 million tests are expected. In Washington, I'm Joe St. George. The latest situation across the country is highlighting the importance of testing. The Omicron variant is leading to a record number of new cases and hospital capacity is being pushed to the brink. CBS's Naomi Ruckham has more. The Omicron variant of COVID-19 continues to move around the country. The risk right now is to the Midwest where you have rising infection, where they aren't in the thick of their Omicron wave yet, and you have states that had high hospitalization rates going into this. 99% of Americans live in areas at high risk for infection. Hospitalizations are up nearly 30%. On a good side, hospitalizations are down relative to cases, but cases are up substantially, so it's pressing hospitals. Cox Hospital in Branson, Missouri, increased its capacity to handle extra patients, but expects to max out again soon. Well, the reason that we're keeping them here in Branson is because Springfield is full, Mercy is full, every place is full. And we're back where we started, where we're, everybody's looking all over the country for beds. It took six months for the U.S. to report its first 4 million COVID-19 cases. The last 4 million took just one week. Over the past three, four weeks, our numbers have jumped uh, just uh, from a couple of hundred cars or appointments per day at each site 
to over uh, 4,000 appointments. According to the CDC, for children under five who are not eligible for the vaccine, four in every 100,000 are currently hospitalized, a pandemic record. That statistic, though, includes children hospitalized because of COVID and those admitted for other reasons and found to be infected. Naomi Ruckham, CBS News. Now we go to Chicago where school is closed for the fourth straight day. The city's teachers union is holding out for additional safety measures. Meanwhile, Omicron mixed with winter weather also continues to disrupt the airline industry. There were 1,300 cancellations yesterday and tracking service FlightAware is reporting more than 600 already today. With so many people now getting infected with Omicron, there are questions about how many of them might develop long haul COVID symptoms. Reporter Maya Rodriguez tries to find that answer. As the Omicron variant sweeps across the nation, prompting long lines at COVID testing sites, a silver lining. So far, there are fewer hospitalizations and deaths from Omicron than from last year's Delta variant. Our vaccines, especially when combined with our boosters, have remained extremely effective at keeping people out of the hospital. But still, since Omicron began spreading in the U.S. over the holiday season, there have been millions of new COVID infections. This Omicron variant is more transmissible than previous versions. Dr. Bruce Y. Lee is a professor at the City University of New York Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. He's been studying and tracking COVID since the pandemic began. Based on the data, it looks like the peak of this current Omicron uh, wave will probably occur sometime uh, in mid-January. By then, millions more Americans could potentially be infected with COVID. But it's what happens in the months after those infections that will need to be looked at closely, including what Omicron might mean in terms of new long-haul COVID cases. Long COVID is something that's many times overlooked and not discussed. People are focusing on things like deaths or potentially hospitalizations. Many people tend to forget there is a, a significant percentage of people who are suffering from long COVID. Dr. Lee says with previous variants, there's been some correlation between how severe a COVID case is and how likely that person will become a long hauler. But this is not a super strong correlation, meaning that there have been many cases of people having mild milder symptoms or milder COVID-19 early on, but they continue to have persistent symptoms. Those can run the gamut, including a loss of taste or smell, muscle pains and brain fog, among others. The World Health Organization defines long COVID as having symptoms more than three months after an initial infection, a timeline we haven't reached yet with Omicron. It's not clear what percentage of people who've been infected with the Omicron variant well develop these persistent long COVID symptoms versus other variants. And something that for Omicron cases might not become clearer until the spring. I'm Maya Rodriguez. And now closer to home, Crow Agency law enforcement is issuing a missing and endangered person advisory for a Wyola man. 47-year-old Kevin Howe left his house Saturday morning after an argument with his wife. Howe took off on foot and headed north on Highway 481. He is 5 foot 11 inches tall. Kevin was last seen wearing a black t-shirt, a dark blue Under Armour sweatshirt, green pants, and black K-Swiss shoes. There are concerns he might try to harm himself. You, if you have seen him or have have any idea of his whereabouts, contact Crow Agency Law Enforcement at 638-2631. A local Army veteran is asking for help this morning after one of his old uniforms was stolen from a storage unit. Aside from the sentimental value, Clint Burdett's basic training uniforms have his name and Social Security number sewed on them. He is concerned about potential identity theft. Burdett says his unit was broken into twice at the end of last year after a malfunctioning gate left KO storage in the Heights vulnerable to thieves. And then they put a padlock of their own on so they can come back later and help themselves to anything they wanted. And it's probably a good thing I came by when I did and spotted that or else I might have been wiped out completely. Burdett wants everyone to be on the lookout for his missing uniform. Along with his name and social security number on it, there is a private first class insignia on the shoulder. If you located it, oh, if you locate it, contact Burdett at 697-3848. 
Talks between the U.S. and Russia over rising tensions along the border with Ukraine start today. The Biden administration doesn't predict any major breakthroughs unless Russia agrees to reduce the number of troops along the Ukraine border. Russia has 100,000 in the area and could double that number very quickly. So far, Russia has remained entrenched in its position with officials saying they will not comply with U.S. demands. And here is a happy update for you this morning. You might remember this video coming out of Afghanistan last summer. A baby boy was handed to a Marine during the U.S. troop withdrawal in Kabul. Well, he will soon be reunited with his parents in Texas. The infant is now in care of his grandfather after being separated from his family for months. The holiday shopping season is well behind us, but the holiday return season is ramping up. UPS says it will handle more than 60 million return packages through January 22nd, the highest ever. CBS's Janet Shamlian has more. Packages are a frequent front door delivery. And those purchased online were a big part of the holiday, topping 20% of sales. The more startling number is the e-commerce return rate, 25% compared to 8% for a physical store. And this is what that can look like. Mountains of cardboard and plastic packaging with valuable merchandise inside. So retailers really aren't equipped to take the product back. The typical retailer uh, hasn't invested in this yet, and you'll see all their returns come back. They pile up, they sit, and it often uh, quarterly or twice a year, they might liquidate them for pennies on the dollar uh, or even potentially destroy them. Tobin Moore is the CEO of Opturo, which helps companies deal with a tsunami of returns. We have now these new racks behind me here where we put bulk cases. This massive warehouse outside Nashville is one of three dozen Optoro uses across the country, processing merchandise for sellers like American Eagle, Target, Bed Bath & Beyond, and others. Workers use Optoro's software to check in the merchandise, ensuring a refund, then relisting the product for a new sale. These items will never go back to the retailer's warehouse. They're held here until sold again. The volume here is incredible. On just these two racks, there are more than 120,000 items that came in as returns, and most will leave this warehouse as a new sale within a week. They're housed here. It's the most efficient thing. Wherever that good comes back, if you can get it back to stock from there, it means less shipments, less touches, less waste. In Houston, Abby McDonald used Happy Returns, Hi. a service that collects customers' unwanted goods for hundreds of companies that sold them. It's postage and box free. Did you already start it online? I did. I have the code. Perfect. A QR code is all you need. McDonald sent back a dress she bought online from the women's clothing company, Draper James. And then it's close to my office, which made it easy to, to pop out at lunch and drop it off here for free. Paper source locations like this are among 3,800 collection points nationwide. An average of 20 returns from multiple sellers shipped in a single box, reducing waste and expediting turnaround time. Not everything is resold. Almost 6 billion tons of returned items will end up in landfills after the holiday season. If an item is the wrong fit for a consumer, finding the right one for that returned product is key. Our technology connects every returned item, no matter the condition, to its next best home as efficiently as possible. Minimizing shipments and getting the product back into stock quickly. A win for buyer, seller, and the planet. Janet Shamley and CBS News. Lebanon, Tennessee. In other news now, it was not the ending most Montanans hoped for, but what a weekend it was for the Bobcats. Thousands of fans made the trip to Frisco, Texas to watch the team compete in its first national championship since 1984. MSU's football team came up short, but a couple of fans who made the trip from Billings are still proud of the coaches and the players. You put your mind to something like uh, the Montana State Bobcats did, you can achieve just about anything you want to. It was a great season. Every year we've been getting a little bit better, and I think the attitude now is, is we just have to take that next step. I think we're close. Football's fun. I think it's more the camaraderie. It's the friendships, the people. The season was successful. I think they're building on something. We're excited about the future. 
The Bobcats opponent, North Dakota State, has won nine of the last four, 14 FCS football championships. Thank you so much for starting your day with us and watching Billings' only local morning newscast. Coming up, we'll have more from one of the biggest sports weekends in Montana State University history and hear from the marching band fresh off their trip to Texas. The time is 544. Stay with us. Miller's forecast is coming up next.